Welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk with Mike Hornby and not Rob Mario. <laughs> <laughs> I am joined by my co-host Bill Stubblefield and Maria Lawrence, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Absolutely. Mike. Absolutely. Good morning. We're moving right along. Um, I think we have Delegate Kayla Young on the phone. Kayla, can you hear us? Hi. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, everybody says that I don't. You know, as a super majority, we don't we don't talk to the Democrats and we don't uh, uh, get along. But I, I get along very well with uh, Delegate Kayla Young. I'm very proud that uh, to have co-sponsored a piece of her legislation uh, for for uh, uh, child marriage or banning child marriage in, in in West Virginia. I think she's one of the most effective minority. Um, delegates and has passed many pieces of legislation uh, down there, at, even though being in the minority. Kayla, how do you do that? Give us a little bit of uh, your thoughts of the legislature and um, how do you go about being in a super minority? Of course. So when I first ran for office in 2020, we weren't in as large of a super minority as we were. And before we were elected, I lobbied for a small organization for like three years. So I got to know the system really, really well, which is by and large the most important part. I think you'll agree with me that the first year, if you don't know how it works, you're kind of just sitting there you know, deer in headlights. But I luckily could hit the ground running and kind of knew, kind of knew that it was all about relationships. And so I spend a lot of time making those relationships and I genuinely like nearly everyone that we work with. And so, um, I, I would say pretty much everyone. And so, um, I just spend a lot of time getting to know people and finding, finding, finding ways that we can work together. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, uh, Kayla. Uh, I'm looking at your uh, uh, your bills. You have something like 103, 104 bills yep. that uh, that you've submitted, but none of them have been uh, uh, approved. They're all pending. Uh, what does that tell me? That was this year, and that tells me that they wised up to the fact that I get a lot of legislation passed. <laughs> also, I get, and that is, can be a problem when, you know, they're trying to beat me. And so uh, the past few years, I've gotten quite a few pieces of legislation passed. It, it also tells me that I don't care if my name's on the top of the bill. Um, if it's a good idea, then I want to get it done. So oftentimes, because I'm in the minority, a lot of committee chairs won't run my bills. So I... I work with uh, folks on the other side to be the lead sponsor. I don't care if it's my name or not. So, Kayla, what would you say coming up um, for this coming legislative session? What um, what are your key uh, pieces of legislation that you're going to work on, uh, key items that you think are important to bring to the forefront? So the number one thing that I've been working on for the last probably two years is child care. And we didn't get anything done on child care this last year. We had a task force. I think Kathy was just on before I was, Delegate Krause. She and I worked on that task force together. But because of budgetary issues with the education stuff the last week of session, we didn't get anything done on child care. But we worked together. We had a package of about seven bills to get through. And so child care remains my number one focus both in this upcoming special session and then also if it's not finished with all that we need to do in the next legislative session if I'm reelected. Do you think there will be something in this special session uh, regarding child care, Kayla? I do think so, yeah. The governor has said that that's the entire point of the call. So I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm hopeful that it's, that it's bills that I can support, but I haven't seen exactly what it's going to be. So you don't he have any details uh, on, on the actual... And the only detail that I have was um, the bill that he proposed, which is a tax credit for yeah. um, families, which is a it's a good piece of legislation, but you have to be able to afford child care on the front end, and it's expensive. Yeah, that's one I'm saying. It's $2,000 refundable child uh, uh, tax credit. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that yeah absolutely. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a good bill, but as we lower people's tax burden and they pay less and less anyways, 
fewer and fewer folks are going to be eligible for it. Yeah, in terms of child care, uh, uh, Kathy, where does the, where does the, uh, Kayla, I'm sorry, where does the focus okay. lie? Is it with uh, the, the organization, the structure of the government, such as DHHR, or is it providing the, the families enough support that they can ensure child care? So I think it, I think of it as a three pronged situation. I think we need to help out the child care providers that already exist because they're struggling. Child care, um, the, the price that people pay is not actually what it costs. It's about a tenth of what it costs. So they're always struggling and we need to do some stability for them, which we have plans to do that. And then I think we need to help parents in the form of either a tax credit or making it so they can find affordable, accessible child care um, so they can lower the burden. It costs more than college every year, and there's very little aid for people. And then I think we also need to help businesses because at the end of the day, child care is about child education and developing those skills, but it's also about making sure that parents can get to work. And so I think the, I think the business community plays a large role in this as well and should be a, a huge part of the table. Yeah, I was going to say, Kayla, I have a friend who actually is a new, uh, well, new young parents in Kanawha County and oh, cool. just their um, situation with trying to find child care is a whole different um, piece than the affordability factor, right? So, absolutely, uh, you know, and they're just like, yeah, we, we're, we're, you know, you have to go in like when you first find out you're expecting to to yeah. sort of line things up because it's not easy you do. for sure. No. Yeah, it's wild. I have a, a 10-year-old and I called looking for child care when he was 1 and they called me back when he was in elementary school. <laughs> yeah. There is that much it's of a wild. wait? Is what you're saying? <laughs> there is a massive wait. Yeah, there's only so many spots because of the ratios of how many kids are safely allowed in classes. We have a like a pretty reasonable ratio because you know because if there's a fire or something, the amount of teachers have to be able to get that amount of children out of a room. So gotcha. it's there, there's ratios involved, but um, yeah, there's a huge need for childcare. We have a like several counties that have zero licensed child care facilities. Now up here in the Eastern Pan, I, I know we have uh, throughout the state we have universal, universal pre-K. Um, yep. For for and I think that's something West Virginia really is excelling at is is our pre K. Um, is it the same way down south for you? Are they, are they really doing well with the pre K? They are. Yeah, what, that's somewhere West Virginia really shines. We've had universal pre K since 2013, and there's a lot of states that still don't. So it's something I'm very proud of that we've done. Another issue that you've addressed is salary increase for state employees. You've sponsored a bill with that. Uh, how does that fly? Uh, how does that uh, work in, in the face of the governor's request for additional tax increase? Well, we did. So we did a tax rate or a salary raise for folks. This year, we've done quite a few since I've been there. There are certain positions that haven't been funded because when we do salary increases, not everyone's funded. Like uh, we had a correctional correctional worker shortage, and we were supposed to give the uh, non uniform employees a, a raise. We promised them a raise. We promised them we'd do it during session, and then we didn't do it. So that's one of the things that I tried to do. And yeah, with, with us cutting the amount of revenue that's coming in, I, I expect we won't be seeing salary increases for state workers um, in the future. I'm worried about the budget in the next few years. When you we'll say salary increases state workers, that kind of paints the, the state with the same brush. Uh, I'm sure you and others recognize there are differences in various parts of the state. Us being a border county uh, with uh, Maryland and, and Virginia. Is, how is this taken into account at your level? We all argue that we need a locality, locality pay, pay, but we're not. But we have not heard a lot of seen a lot of support uh, from other parts of the state. How would you address the locality pay issue? That's a great question, and honestly, I can't even recall how I voted on locality pay in the past. I'm fairly certain that I supported it because I know that the that that your old way of life in the in the eastern panhandle is significantly different than it is i'm in mean, kanawha county in charleston and so it's way 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 different we're not competing with those border states i know you guys have that going on and we do need to be able to address it uh on a much more local basis 
Bill stole my question. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're always prepared, Maria. You probably have the third, fourth, fifth question in standby. No, no. I was going down the locality pay tunnel and 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 just got closed off. So she answered that question. So I'm done. Okay. Uh, well, I'll shift here. Uh, an another issue that's very critical to us in the Eastern Panhandle is a certificate of need. Uh, I'm sure you that's you're quite aware of this issue as well. Yep. I am quite it? aware of the issue. Yeah, and honestly, that has been one that um, I have never really understood why there's such a big fight about it. I honestly don't have a massively strong feeling on it either way. I feel like we've gotten rid of it to a, to a fairly large extent, but obviously not completely. But, I mean... In general, I think it's a bigger issue that healthcare is just entirely broken and that it's completely focused on on financial outcomes for those in charge and not focused on patient care. And that's my biggest that's my biggest qualm with the whole thing. Um, so honestly, on certificate of need, I think I voted for it sometimes, for it some other times. That's one that I, there's so it's like half the states have it, half of them don't, but everyone's health care seems to be like equally bad for people so i that's my concern as it comes to that well this is another example of the difference in the part of uh various parts of the state uh we in the eastern panhandle even though we have locality pay issues we have phenomenal health care facilities not only within yeah. uh, west virginia but we all the neighboring states uh the other parts of the state, uh, Mingo County, Boone County, and the like, uh, what, how, are you addressing, how are you addressing their issues that they really do need better health care? Yeah, they really do need better health care. And with the consolidation of all the health care down here, so I'm in Kanawha County, and um, I used to serve a district that was uh, much larger than mine. Pretty, most of Kanawha County is what it used to be, and now it's a lot smaller. And so I used to have two different health care systems in my district, and so one of them loved certificate of need one of them hated it so that was always a sticky wicket for me but um i don't know how we fix it for them because as the population lowers the base of it becomes harder and harder to to get health care for them uh, i wish that was more of a focus during session and it just hasn't been so switching gears a little bit kayla you uh you're obviously you've got an election coming up i believe i believe you're opposed i do um, how do you, as a uh, Democrat within West Virginia, with, with, you know, with, with Trump at the top of the ticket, how do you run your campaign? Because um, obviously, I, I, you know, it, it's an uphill battle, but how do you run your campaign? How do you talk to your people as a Democrat uh, running for office in West Virginia? Yeah, so my race is the toughest race in the state, actually. The yeah. way that they drew the district and because of just, you know, the current politics of West Virginia, it's very difficult. And so I try to find issues and I try to work on issues that um, that my constituents care about. So my district is split down the middle. It's the most purple district in the state, but, and you and know. And geographically, what, what does, is it... Uh, Geographically, it's um, half of South Hills, the neighborhood Hills, in, in yep. Charleston, and it, it's like a third of a couple neighborhoods. It's like a long, skinny, kind of looks like a piece of spaghetti, honestly. Gotcha. It's just like, it's it's a little bit of South Charleston, St. Albans, and, and South Hills in Charleston. So, um, it's a more affluent district, and then it does go out to a very rural neighborhood. So, I, I'm always concerned that my people aren't aren't um, getting full representation just because there's different ideological spectrums within it because I have some precincts that went for Biden last time and then I would have some that went like 80% for Trump so oh, wow. it's all over the place but I try to serve everybody the same everybody drives on roads um, I think and I think you would agree that I'm a little more left than my district is personally but I try to take that into account anytime I'm making votes and, and I try to vote with what my district wants me to do and sometimes I make votes that wouldn't have been my first choice, but it, I'm not there for me, right? I'm there yeah. for them. So I, I was gonna. Um, I just try to talk to people. Yeah, I was going to comment on that, Kayla. I think sometimes it's uh, you know p politicians, elected <laughs> officials, um, you know they have their own ideology and that's why they get yeah. elected obviously but at some point you do have to look at the you know at the at 
the way your district is configured and and what you think your district would want or you ask um, your constituents what they would want and and go from there right absolutely i yeah i try to be very very close with my constituents and i try to know what they want um i use social media a lot to try to do that and i try to educate people on on how the legislature works because i feel like a lot of people come to us when they're in a crisis or when something's bad and i don't want that to be the case i want them to know that um I want them to kind of know what's going on so so they can kind of keep up because you know the, the decisions that we make affect them way more than the decisions in Washington do a lot of the time. Along along that line, you're running against the same one you ran against last time, last cycle. You yep. beat him by 60 votes, uh, which yep. is which is fairly close. Uh, has has the dynamics changed that much uh, uh, that you think you'll win by a greater margin, or is it going to be even closer? I mean, I run scared all the time. I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't know that was going to happen last time. And, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I'm nervous and I'm working hard because I really enjoy doing this work. And I love representing people and I love working for the state. And so um, I don't know what's going to happen. I hope I'll win, but I'm sure everybody feels that way about themselves. So, Kayla, what if you do win, uh, what... Yeah. What piece of legislation or what uh, issues will you be uh, looking forward to for next session? And also, how do you feel about this uh, uh, governor's uh, extra tax cut that he's asking us to? Yeah, um, honestly, OK, so uh, the tax cut, I'm not sure if he knew and I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not sure if he knew about the triggers that were coming into place because he asked for an additional five percent. And then almost immediately after a, a, a 4% cut went in. So I'm not clear if he wants another 5% yeah, I think, I on think top he, of that. On top of the trigger, he wants us to exactly. additionally yeah. add another 5%. So or round it up to okay. 30%. Or round it, round it up yeah. to 30 yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm open to looking at that. I haven't looked at the numbers. Um, we used to... used to be that you would get a six-year look ahead when you, when you saw the financial stuff. So you would see how how the culmination of all the decisions that we make go into play, whether it be the Hope Scholarship, whether it be the tax cuts. We've made a lot of really big financial decisions um, when we've had a ton of COVID money. And so I'm nervous that we're not going to have the money to do these tax cuts. I think we'll be fine this year. I think we'll be fine next year. And I think come 2027, we're starting to get a little dicey. And so I'm, I'm definitely open to giving people relief. If we have extra money and all of our services are appropriately funded, which they haven't been for the past few years, we've had a flat budget, which means no tech increases, no, no, lots of things that those folks need. Um, if we can do it, I'd love to do it, but I'm not sure if we can. Let's let me curious back to the conversation that we had before you came on with uh, with Kathy about homeschooling. Uh, this has yeah. become a very controversial, a very polarized issue. There have been a few examples recently that uh, that folks say the homeschool has a ba has a fundamental problem. Others say no, it does not have a fundamental problem. It's been driven totally out of context because of the the pros or the cons. Uh, what is your feeling? with homeschooling is there a problem and are there fixes that are needed um i don't believe that there's a fundamental problem with homeschool not at all i think people have the right to um, educate their children in a way that they see fit as parents um i believe we passed a bill that said just as much but um Excuse me a second. I Excuse me. So, so I did not mean conceptually. I meant uh, organizationally, uh, the way it's regulated is what I meant. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what the answer is. I know that a lot of the people, uh, I think we should look at the causes as to why people are homeschooling. There's a lot of people who just homeschool because they want to. It's my understanding that 70% of people that have been pulling their kids out of public school to homeschool have been because they've received a truancy letter, which tells me that those people might not be that interested in homeschooling, or at least a portion of those people might not be that interested in homeschooling. But I think that's a conversation that we need to have with them. Um, I'm a big proponent of Rayleigh's law that we tried to get passed into a homeschooling bill this last year, and it completely blew up and was wild. 
But um, what is that? I think that one's completely reasonable, which is if can, can you can, their kids. Can you go ahead yeah. and explain what Rayleigh's law is for our audience? Because yeah. I don't I don't think uh, yeah. a lot of people up here know about that. Yeah. So there was a girl. Her name is Rayleigh Browning, and um, she was pulled out of school and because um, there was a pending abuse and neglect case against one of her parents. I believe it was her father. She was pulled out of school because there was a, uh, the pending case because the teachers had called it in because they're mandatory reporters. They called it in. The parents pulled her out of school. She died um, a couple weeks later, I believe. Is I don't, The timeline might be off, but she ended up dying because the abuse and neglect. And so... Um, the law says, the, the proposed law says that if someone wants to pull their kids out of school for homeschooling, they need to just do a quick check that takes two weeks. It has to be done within two weeks. Um, just run it through DHHR and confirm there aren't any pending abuse and neglect cases. Seems very reasonable to me. Um, just to make sure that we're protecting kids because after they, after they leave the public school system, there are no more eyes on them anymore. So it's just to check on them. So I was a proponent of that. We got it passed through the House just barely, and then the Senate never took it up. I think they intentionally killed the bill. However, going back to the first question, I think something needs to happen. I don't know what that is, and I want to do it while protecting people's freedom. Um, I don't know what that is at all. It sounds. I think we have a lot of issues where if school's the only place where kids have eyes on them, that tells me our communities are broken to an extent, and that makes me really sad. I have two young children, and I just can't imagine that. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm open to talking to people. I know our regulations are somewhere in the middle as far as schooling goes, and other states don't seem to have these problems, as, as at least not as frequent as we do, it, it seems and feels. So I don't know what the answer is. Does homeschooling and private schools, Kayla, does that strengthen or weaken um, uh, public education? Having them? Yes. I don't think it has anything to do with public education, other as far as like just them existing. I think it's fine. Okay. When it comes to taking the funding out of public schooling to to fund those other schools, I think that's a conversation. But I think we've always had all three forms of schooling, and I don't see that going anywhere. I don't know that it should go anywhere. Kayla, we just got a couple of minutes left. What do you want to tell our audience um, about yourself and you? How are you doing as a Democrat, Dan? Dan and <laughs> <laughs> we just got two minutes well, left. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, you know, with national politics. So I think not just me as a Democrat, but me just as a person, I, I would tell people that I hope they're still encouraged to vote, regardless of who they're voting for. I think in West Virginia, a lot of people don't come out and vote. And I also hope that people will pay attention to who they're voting for and research who they're voting for when it comes to the state legislature. Um, there are so many people in the legislature, not so many, there's a portion of people in the legislature that I've never heard them talk out loud. And I just wonder what they're doing there and wonder if they're rep representing their constituents well. And, and that's not necessarily in your neck of the woods or mine. It's right. just, I want, I want to work with people. I don't care what their ideology is. I just want to work with people that care about what they're doing. So and over, so over under in November, too. over under in November are there are going to be more Democrats in Charleston or less in the House? Oh, God, I don't know. I, I, I hope in the Senate, in Take the a Senate gamble. I think probably about the same. In the House, so we're, there's 11 of us out of 100 right now. We're starting down three. I'm hopeful we can break even, honestly. That would that's, be a win in, in your that's mind? That's my hope. Right. Uh, that would be not a loss in my mind. I don't know if it would be a win or not. Right. Both times that I've been elected, my caucus has been cut in half that night. So it's, I'm used to this, I feel like, at this point. But I do think that the pendulum will have to swing back in some capacity. I don't know that that happens with Trump on the ballot. But, um, you know, that's really hard to overcome. Kayla, thank you so, so much for joining you. us. I appreciate it. Um, and I look for, for are, are you going to be in uh, Greenbrier this weekend? I will, yeah. I'll see you All there. Right. I'll see you there. Thank you. You are listening to TV 10 and WNR.